Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Pieces of China, a series which tells the story of China one object at a time. My name is Dinda Elliott. I'm the director of programs at China Institute. And today we are so delighted to have Li Jia Zhang, a wonderful writer and journalist who was born in Nanjing, I believe, but now is based in Beijing, um, not in Beijing today. She's in Lon ca calling in from London. Um, Li Jia is the author of Socialism is Great, a worker's memoir of, a new of the new China and a novel called Lotus, her first, which is her first novel. Um, she is now working on a historical fiction novel, um, which we are looking forward to reading. So Li Jia is going to talk today about a missile factory in Nanjing. So we're excited to hear about that. So Li Jia, please join us and let's uh, jump into our conversation. Go ahead and turn on your camera. Great. Yes, Welcome. Yes. Hi, hi. Thank Welcome, you Lydia. for your <laughs> kind introduction. Thank you for having me. So great to have you. All right. So Lydia, let's let's just take us back in time. And we have a couple of photographs, which are going to be wonderful for us to look at for our audience to see. Mm -hmm. Take us mm -hmm. back in time. Um, the first, I mean, tell us a little bit about what this is first, and then we'll go to your first job at the missile factory. So All right. which, which one are you here? I'm the middle child. Okay. We never had too much attention in the family. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the middle child. Was, uh, more beautiful, uh, smarter one, and then there was a boy. So I was. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so what year? What year was this taken? So I guess I was about probably about ten years old. So 1974. 74. Okay, so you were born in 64 and lived through the Cultural Revolution. Wow, amazing. Okay, so um, so let's look at the next slide. And, and Li Jia, let's go to your first job. These slides are just kind of, you know, going to give us a sense of what, what the mood was during those times. So tell us about your first job at the Chinese Missile Factory. What year was that? How did you end up there? And, and what was it like? Take us back in time. Right, so um, I became a factory worker when I was 16, but here it was probably, I don't know, 20 to early my early 20s, I've been working at a factory for a while. And so the reason was very simple. I did not choose to become a factory worker. I actually wanted to become a writer and journalist. Um, but uh, my mother being uneducated, I don't think she saw the benefit of education and we were poor, so I was dragged out of school. And uh, I took over her job and she got another job. So it was a financial reason. And so my job was to test pressure gauge at the factory. Okay. This. That's pressure <laughs> gauge. Okay. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it was a very, very boring. And, um, but my mother wanted me to be grateful. So she thought the most important thing was to secure a job, especially my factory was uh, very prestigious, among other things, that uh, it produced intercontinental missiles. Um, but uh, my job was just to fix the pressure gauge, very simple <laughs> and repetitive. So I'm right. afraid I'm, uh, I was no nuclear scientist. Yeah, so that, so that was around, I guess that was around 1980. Sorry, so 1980, were starting... 1980, precisely. So yes, I worked for yeah 10 years at the factory. Okay. So things were starting to change at that time in China. Of course, Deng Xiaoping had come back into power and the Cultural Revolution was ending. But was it still a very, I mean, did you still have kind of red political slogans everywhere? And what describe a little bit what it was like? Yes, so that was, um, uh, I, I became a factory worker when I was 16, that's um, in 1980, so you can quickly work out how old I am precisely. <laughs> so uh, Deng Xiaoping introduced the ref reform and, and opening up in 1970, end of 1978, but uh, the effect took a while. So um, at that time there was a high unemployment because uh, uh, the Red Guards were sent to the countryside and returned. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, it was um, a difficult time. So there was a temporary policy which allowed parents to retire early. So the, my factory was a state owned. So it's so very much run like a mini communist state. So the factory provided lots of things. Like for example, the uh, the comedy, uh, the the dormitory we stayed they were allocated by the factory, and uh, the factory provided healthcare, you know, the shell house and dining hall and everything, but also very much 
controlled our life. You know, everything I did was within that confinement of the factory. And the first day we entered the quack factory, there was just so many not to do. You shouldn't do this, shouldn't do that. Um, I worked at the factory for 10 years. I never had any promotion. For one important reason, my bosses thought I wear a perm. But uh, I, actually, I'm just one of the few Chinese who got naturally curly hair. In those days, only people with bourgeoisie outlooking life would have a permed hair. So I didn't have the correct ideology, therefore did not deserve a promotion. So I worked uh, at the factory um, for 10 years as uh, doing very junior <laughs> job. <laughs> wow, Li Jia, that's an incredible, incredible um, fact about you that you then you went then went on to become a novelist and a journal. So journalist. So then you started studying English. And yes. tell us a little bit about why, what were your first phrases studying English? And how did that affect your life? Uh, well, um, so I hated my life uh, at the factory, so um, I decided to find, I need to find a way to get out. So I decided to teach myself English um, in the hopes that I'll get a, a, a job with one of the foreign Western companies that was slowly setting up shops in Nanjing. Mm -hmm. And of course, I'm looking back and learning English and effectively changed my life um, after uh, the first uh, sentence I learned was at a school, long live Chairman Mao. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was, yes, um, uh, it also in 1980, because that was uh, the first year of my junior middle school, Chujong, right. so um, where I studied for a few years before I was dragged out of school. So, mm -hmm. and was still the first sentence was long live Chairman Mao. And then I decided to sign up to um, an evening course. So there I learned my second English sentence, which is still um, it's called, um, language is a tool of class struggle. Wow. <laughs> we could hardly just, it was quite a long, complicated. <laughs> <laughs> so wow. in those days, I would write down write down the, the words. I had trouble to remember the words. It's so alien. So I've, um, English become English <laughs> <laughs> means hard, burp, rotten. <laughs> oh my God, English. Okay, good, 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 good. Yeah. So, so Take take us through then what happened. If so, you're studying English, and then you managed to make your way to Beijing, and your your world changed, and you became a journalist. Yeah, but that's a that's a very slow, long process. So I start began to teach myself English. I I signed up, signed up English learning courses, and I signed Teach Yourself uh, University. I on weekends I went to English Corner to practice English with other people. We always spoke so loudly as if the lack, the volume can compensate the lack for the lack of fluency. And if a foreigner passed by, will grab him or her and say, where are you from? How much money are you in? <laughs> How many children do you have? <laughs> Don't worry, Ira, if I meet you next time, I wouldn't ask you this kind of personal questions. I've become a bit more sophisticated, like to think. <laughs> Wow. And my English was so awful, but I was always willing to talk. And I would find myself riding bicycle in the stuck street of Nanjing, singing carpenter songs. Great. <laughs> my so, you know, so, so, Lijia, I'm really curious. You know, you recently wrote about the government's <laughs> new approach towards yeah. the English language. Yeah. And I'm really interested. I think our audience would love to hear. Tell us a little bit about what's happening. What do you see happening? And what are you concerned about? What I'm concerned about, so being a few years now, um, and there has been a debate about the relevance of the English language. Uh -huh. And uh, um, last year, there were two proposals, both relating to English. One is suggesting that the um, press conference just say, don't provide English. And another is to reduce the importance of language in the school, which has been already happening. Um, and also, I think English should be a neutral word. Learning English should be a neutral word. Now it's kind of associated with the Western influence, mm. which has quite a, 
um, now has a negative connotation. For example, uh, feminist. Feminist now labeled as kind of a Western import. Mm -hmm. designed at you know overthrown China had a bad intention so so that's uh, worrying and I think at this time there there's there's I, I sense there's a growing um, anti-China sentiment and I can understand why but I think this particularly at this time we need China needs to engage with the world mm. and so English will be uh, should be a vital part of that mission. Right, right. I mean, one of the amazing accomplishments, I think, of China's over the last, you know, 10, 20 years yeah. is, is young Chinese graduates yeah. tend to speak amazing English. I mean, they're yeah, yes, they yeah. extremely, um, you know, fluent. Um, but do you worry that that will sort of fade away? It would not fade away, but uh, and I think it's not very, it's, I think it's at China at this stage now when um there's you know growing anti-china sentiment um misunderstanding i think the language should play a positive role to in promote engagement and uh, understanding of uh, of you know outside world instead of uh, um kind of a cut that tie and reduce the importance of language mm -hmm. yeah and there's there's also growing anti-western sentiment in china right it's yes. not just anti-China sentiment from from yeah, exactly. West. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 right. Yeah. And the sort of rise of nationalism. Um, I'm really curious, Li Jia. Mm -hmm. You you wrote a wonderful book. Your novel called Lotus is about a streetwalker. Yes. And I'm really curious about what interested you about that topic and the so-called sort of underside of China's economic miracle, right? I mean, what's happened in 40 years in China is nothing short of miraculous, right? But yeah. Your novel looked at a different side of China. Why? What interested you? So um, it was uh, inspired by my, the story of my grandmother. Um, and um, now it's almost um, 15, 20 years ago, just before in front of her deathbed, I learned a long kept family secret that my grandmother was um, a prostitute, a sex worker in her youth. So you don't associate your grandmother with a prostitute. So I was shocked. And then my mother explained them. She, my grandmother became an orphan and adopted by her aunt. And then her uncle just sold her into a brothel. So, <clears throat> so I became very interested in prostitution and wondering how my grandmother coped. And then um, shortly after my, this revelation, I went down to Shenzhen to travel. And uh, I ended up a place actually just the front of uh, as, as a brothel. And the young migrant workers, well, they didn't even know they do the massage and things and wearing mm -hmm. shoe clothes. So that's, uh, I decided to write a, a book. I mean, the prostitution for me, just an interesting window to see China mm -hmm. uh, to see how the impact on ordinary people, the reform opening up. And I think prostitution touches up on some important issues China's facing facing today. You know, rural um, urban migration, the gender um, gap, which is widening um, um, during the reform era because women have shouldered much of the burden, the cost of the um, economic reforms. And um, so, yes, yeah, so that's um, that's why I launched myself into this project, which it took me 12 years to finish, but I, wow. I did manage it. <laughs> wow. So, Li Jia, why do you say that women have shouldered most of the costs of economic reforms? What do you mean by that? I mean, for example, the things that we introduced, the Deng Xiaoping introduced reform opening up. So many people benefit of it, from it, especially urban people, women as well, especially urban educated. But... Uh, um, um, but the competition hasn't been unfair. Like, for example, my factory, the women are always the first to be led off and more women being led off than, um, than women. And once they lose their job, it's very difficult for them to find employment. And that's also, that's, um, that's not too um, unusual in Eastern, uh, Eastern Europe, the country when they transitioned from the planned economy to the market economy, women also suffered more. So yeah, 
So mm -hmm. I think um, even though Chairman Mao proclaimed that women can hold up half the sky, um, the gender inequality actually have widened. Women now making less money compared to say 30 years ago. And it's so fascinating. It seems like such an um, sort of an irony that the word feminism is kind of outlawed on the Chinese internet. You know, it's, it's yeah, yeah, it exactly. seems so odd. Um, so I'm so glad you went back to the factory. Our time is almost up. So I wanted to ask you to tell us what's happening at the missile missile factory <clears throat> now. Oh, the missile factory is still there, but the key parts have been moved to some secret location. I I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the most parts still there be downsized. The, the workshop where I used to work now, the compound has been turned into an art complex. Oh my God. And, you know, so they maintain the feature, you know, the, the, on the wall, still long live Chairman Mao, insisting on socialism, road socialism is great, <laughs> but uh, it's all been turned into a a uh, commercial compound, the lots of film studios, art galleries have moved in. So everywhere you actually see um, capitalism <laughs> screaming everywhere. <laughs> wow, that is fascinating. So it's sort of like the 798 of Nanjing. Yes, so the right? Nanjing is the 798. Wow. Uh, still, when you enter the compound, you will see a um, rocket, a missile. <laughs> oh my <laughs> Not God. <really> long. <laughs> what an amazing full circle story, right? You've just one factory that reflects 40 years of dramatic change and that sort of epitomizes the change right the, that's that's just an incredible story thank you Lija thank oh, you so pleasure. much for um sharing you know the story of China with us we're so so grateful and um I want to to the audience please forgive the dog in the background um I want to the audience to thank you um for joining us and to uh, tell you that we have a whole series of wonderful Chinese New Year's programs coming up, um, starting with there's a family festival for kids on Saturday with activities and storytelling. And next Thursday, we have the wonderful Chinese designer Han Feng um, talking about design and art with Nancy Berliner, the curator at the Museum of Boston Museum of Fine Arts China Galleries. Um, on Tuesday the 8th, we're going to have a fabulous Chinese New Year variety show with music, dance and drummers all online. Um, and the story of the tiger. And uh, we have Liz Economy on the world talking about her new book, The World According to China, after that. And finally, on February, Friday, February 11th, we've got China Institute's very own Ben Wang, who's going to be talking about Chinese couplets that are about the new year, written by Puru, I think it was Puyi's brother, Puru. So um, we've got a whole bunch of great stuff. And Li Jia, I just can't thank you again. Can I just give you an example of how what I, my English sounded like? Yes. Mary Kelly Sumus, and Happy New Year. That's so wonderful. Well, Happy New Year to you and to everybody. Li Jia, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. We'll see you back to our stage soon. Okay. Bye bye then. Okay. Bye. bye. Yeah.